Um, first of all, uh, a huge welcome um, to you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry that uh, we're slightly late started for uh, just a couple of reasons, but thank you for your, your patience tonight uh, on a, a wild night to come out. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure on behalf of Uncover Cork, um, a series of community spaces in the city for life's big questions, um, because uh, we believe as the organizers, as people from uh, different churches, uh, as uh, Christian unions on the university campuses, um, joint, uh, including speakers from uh, Atheist Ireland and the Islamic community. And we really believe that uh, questions need honest thinking and spaces for them. And it's a great delight uh, this evening to, um, uh, to have you all here. And without further ado, um, I'm going to, uh, to pass over to our chair for tonight, Pierce uh, McHenry, his lecture in Migration Studies in the Department of Geography in UCC, um, and has researched and published extensively in this field. He thus has a long-standing interest in cross-cultural issues, um, including questions concerning secularism, uh, multiculturalism, and integration in society. Uh, prior to his post in UCC, he served with the Department of Foreign Affairs in Brussels, uh, Beirut and Paris. Um, and so uh, it is a, a great delight to put our hands together um, and welcome uh, Pierce as our chair this evening. Um, just before Pierce comes, uh, two brief uh, health and safety announcements. Uh, the, the, main, uh, fire, the main fire escapes um, are uh, at, fairly obvious at the doors. Um, and uh, please use them. Uh, the toilet, should you need one, uh, an usher at the back, um, at the back of tonight's event, uh, will point you towards the toilets um, if uh, that's the case. Um, thank you very much again for coming, and over to Pierce. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, and good evening, everybody. You're all extremely welcome. On behalf of UCC and the Christian Unions Ireland, and indeed Atheist Ireland, I'd like to make you welcome uh, to tonight's debate. I should say, by the way, uh, in, in my own defence, um, a little bit about why I'm here. <laughs> uh, my name is Pierce McHenry, and my interest is actually neither in philosophy nor theology. But I have lived in a number of countries over my life, and I do study questions of integration and the impact, for instance, of the arrival of communities from a different faith background in societies that traditionally wouldn't have been used to them. I've lived in two countries in my life with major issues around religious conflict. One is Ireland, obviously. The other one is Lebanon. And in both cases, I had first-hand experience, so to speak, of differences in religious views. I then went to live in France, where um, obviously the prevailing philosophy is one of secularism. And I discovered somewhat to my surprise, perhaps, that secularism isn't the answer to everything either. It assumes that faith is something that you can tidy away tie it neatly and put into the domain of your private life, and the public sphere will somehow be pristine and untouched by issues of faith, and we know that's not the case either. So I think um, for anyone uh, with my experience, and know that many of you here in the audience too, questions of the existence of God are absolutely central. Um, whether you reject that uh, existence or whether you accept it, and the question of how we then live in society around that central question, the meaning of life, and in particular, uh, the, the role that God plays in that belief, um, if uh, there is a role in your own personal belief system. And I think it's a tribute, um, and before I go any further, I should also say Ireland itself has secularized, of course, in the last 20 years. We did it very rapidly and in a rather precipitate fashion. Um, there are those who will regret that and those who will celebrate it. But at the very least, I think um, the sheer size of the audience tonight, uh, it's extraordinary actually. It's proof of the fact that these are still very live, current questions for all of us to consider. Uh, I can think of very few occasions uh, or very few subjects which would attract an audience of the scale that we have here tonight. We not only have this room full, but in fact the lecture theatre next door where there's an overspill and people can see us uh, via um, an internet connection. That room, as far as I know, is full as well. And that's, that's an extraordinary tribute to um, the, the ever-current nature and importance of the topic for those of you who have come here. And again, can I say, uh, you're extremely welcome. Uh, a few practical notes before we begin and before I hand you over to the two speakers. Uh, this is a relatively for formal format, if I can put it that way, and I, what I would ask is that you listen to all of the speakers respectfully, that you uh, refrain from clapping between speeches or during them. So this is not the philosoph. Uh, it's, it's, it's a somewhat, somewhat different format. Um, what we're going to do is um, each speaker 
We'll be starting with um, Bill uh, Craig and we'll be moving on to uh, Michael Nugent. Each, each speaker will have 20 minutes for an opening presentation. And following those two opening presentations, there will be rebuttals by each speaker of the other speaker's opening presentation. That will be for 11 minutes and we'll, we'll be fairly strict with time. Following which there will be second rebuttals, so rebuttals of the rebuttals, if you can follow me, of seven minutes. Uh, after that then, there will be um, a short break and what we're asking you to do at that moment is to either uh, tweet your questions, if you, if you have questions, um, and the Twitter address is there someplace, uh, yes it's Uncover Cork, so it will be ampersand, that A type of thing, Uncover Cork, if you have a question, or write them down and pass them to one of the organisers. So um, it won't be a question of a free-for-all with the audience, but rather we, we want to give people time to think of their questions, send them to us, as I say, on paper or by Twitter, and then we'll have time to organise the questions for the last uh, part of the session where we'll have, first of all, closing statements of five minutes each, for each from the two speakers, and then we'll have questions and answers and the reason I'm asking you for the questions is that we want to be able to spread them fairly between the two speakers. So it'll be speaker, 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 speaker. Each person will have the same number of questions and they'll speak alternately. So we want to keep an absolute uh, balance and fairness in how the entire arguments and the two speakers are dealt with uh, throughout the evening. Uh, so that's, they're, they're the main points um, I want to make. Um, as I say, if you could refrain from clapping, uh, either during the speeches or during them, between the speeches or during them. The questions we'll collect at the break and the questions will be to alternate speakers where we'll see that as, as things unfold uh, later in the evening. So we have two very eminent uh, speakers tonight and I'm going to uh, mention and, and describe them briefly to you before we, we pass to our first speaker. Michael Nugent is an Irish writer and activist. He has written, co-written or contributed to many books and to the comedy musical play I Kino, uh, which enjoyed a very uh, extended run uh, and a very popular um, reception some years back in Ireland. He's chairperson of Atheist Ireland and he describes uh, Atheist Ireland as an advocacy group for um, atheism, reason and ethical secularisation. And he's a vocal spokesperson in Ireland and beyond for atheism, reason and an ethical secular state. He's debated in many universities and has shaped policy by speaking to lawmaking bodies in Ireland, Europe and abroad. And incidentally, he has two websites and both of them are worth looking at. I've listened to some of uh, his um, podcasts there. One is simply michaelnugent.com and the other is www.atheist.ie. So anyone interested um, can follow up. Uh, we also have Dr. William Lane Craig, who's Research Professor of Philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology and he's a professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. He runs an organization called Reasonable Faith, and again, they've got a website too, it's called www.reasonablefaith.org. And as well as being author of over uh, 30 books, he's author or editor of over 30 books, sorry, nearly 200 peer-reviewed academic articles in professional journals of theology and philosophy. And he's well known for debates all over the world with famous atheists, uh, I can tell you he's debated some of the biggest and I'm, I'm sure that the names uh, would probably be known to you. Um, and again, I should mention that um, our host tonight, Christians Union Ireland, are an interdenominational uh, coalition of uh, different Protestant uh, confessions or faiths here and they're mainly interested in outreach uh, to students and to young people. So this is a very appropriate context for them as well. So I'd like to begin now by inviting Bill to come to the podium and speak for the first 20 minutes. You're welcome, Bill Craig, please. Good evening. Let me begin by thanking the Christian Union for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. Um, Jan and I have visited Ireland decades ago, and so we were very grateful for the invitation to come back and participate in this event. And I'm also grateful to Mr. Nugent for his willingness to participate. Now in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First, there are good reasons to think that theism is true. And second, there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. 
Now, I'll leave it up to Mr. Nugent to present his arguments for atheism before I respond. In this opening speech, I want to sketch briefly five reasons in favor of God's existence. As a professional philosopher, I'm convinced that God makes sense of a wide range of the data of human experience, including philosophical, scientific, ethical, historical, and existential considerations. What are some of these data? Well, number one, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are powerful philosophical arguments, as well as strong scientific evidence, that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. Number one, arguments based upon the impossibility of the existence of an actually infinite number of things. Two, arguments based upon the impossibility of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. Three, evidence from the expansion of the universe. And four, evidence from the second law of thermodynamics. In my published work, I've unfolded these four considerations in considerable detail. They show that the past is not infinite, but that the universe, uh, by which I mean all of space-time reality, had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. Fortunately, I needn't go into these arguments tonight since Mr. Nugent elsewhere agrees that the universe began to exist. Since something cannot come into being from nothing, the absolute beginning of the universe implies the existence of a transcendent cause of the universe. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. One, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. Three, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. Now, Mr. Nugent actually concedes this conclusion, stating that it is, and I quote, relatively uncontroversial that something caused the universe. But what sort of being was it? Well, from the very nature of the case as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, and immaterial being which created the universe. Moreover, it must arguably be personal as well. As Oxford philosopher Richard Swinburne points out, there are two types of causal explanations. Explanations in terms of natural laws and initial conditions, and explanations in terms of personal agents and their volitions. For example, if I walk into the kitchen and uh, ask Jan, why is the kettle boiling? She might answer, the heat of the flame is being conducted by the copper bottom of the kettle to the water molecules, increasing their kinetic energy so that they vibrate so violently that they break the surface tension of the water and are thrown off in the form of steam. Or she might say, I put it on to make a cup of tea. Would you like some? Each is a perfectly legitimate form of explanation. Indeed, in certain contexts, it would be wholly inappropriate to give the one rather than the other. Now, a first state of the universe cannot have a causal explanation in terms of natural laws operating on initial conditions, since there is no prior physical state. But it can be accounted for in terms of a transcendent personal agent and his volitions, an unembodied mind. And thus we are brought not merely to an uncaused cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, a life-permitting universe. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery 
that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. It's important to understand that the term fine-tuned does not mean designed, much less designed for man. The expression is a neutral term used by secular scientists, which doesn't say anything about what the purpose of the universe is or how the fine-tuning is best explained. Fine-tuning just means that the range of life-permitting values for the fundamental parameters of the universe is extremely narrow. These parameters are of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. Second, in addition to these constants, you find certain arbitrary quantities which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an incomprehensibly narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the delicate balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are incomprehensibly more probable than any life-permitting universe. Now, there are three possible explanations of the extraordinary fine-tuning in the scientific literature. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity since, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. So could the fine-tuning be due to chance? The problem here is that the odds that all of the constants and quantities would fall by chance into the tiny life-permitting range are so infinitesimal that they cannot be reasonably faced. Therefore, the proponents of chance have been forced to recur to a remarkable metaphysical hypothesis, the multiverse. According to this hypothesis, there exists an infinite number of randomly ordered, unseen, parallel universes, so that by chance alone, finely tuned universes will appear somewhere in the ensemble. There are many problems with the multiverse hypothesis as an explanation of fine-tuning, but let me highlight the most important. If our universe were just a random member of a multiverse, then we ought to be observing a very different universe than we do. Roger Penrose of Oxford University has pressed this objection forcefully. He points out that the odds of our universe's initial low entropy conditions existing by chance alone are one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. By contrast, the odds of our solar systems coming together suddenly by the random collision of particles is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 60. This number, says Penrose, is utter chicken feed in comparison to 10 to the 10 to the 123. What that means is that it is far more likely that we should be observing an orderly patch no larger than our solar system since a universe like that is so unfathomably more probable than a finely tuned universe like ours. In fact, the most probable observable universe is one which consists of a single brain which pops into existence by a random fluctuation with illusory perceptions of the external world. So, 
if you accept the multiverse hypothesis, you're obligated to believe that you are all that exists and that this auditorium, your body, the earth, and everything you perceive are illusions of your brain. No sane person believes such a thing. On atheism, therefore, it is highly improbable that there exists a randomly ordered multiverse. With the failure of the multiverse hypothesis, the alternative of chance collapses. Neither physical necessity nor chance provides a good explanation of the fine tuning of the universe. Therefore, it follows the best explanation is design. Thus, the life-permitting universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number three, the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. Our first two arguments give us a creator and designer of the universe, but they don't tell us anything about his moral character. How do we know that he is good? My third argument addresses that question. Premise one states, if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. Michael Nugent agrees with this premise. On his view, morality is just, and I quote, a property of our brains, an evolved trait of social animals that enables us to live together. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit empathy and reciprocity because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, homo sapiens, have evolved similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of sociobiological pressures, there has emerged among homo sapiens a sort of herd morality that functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there isn't anything that makes this morality objectively binding and true. But that leads us to our second premise, that objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. That does not imply that our moral experience is infallible, but only that it is not wholly delusory. Our apprehension of the moral realm is analogous to our apprehension of the physical realm. Just as in the absence of some defeater, we are rational to trust the fallible deliverances of our five senses, that there really is a world of physical objects out there, so too, in the absence of some defeater, we are rational to trust our moral apprehensions. And there is no such defeater. As the philosopher Louise Anthony so nicely puts it, any argument for moral skepticism will be based upon premises which are less obvious than the reality of objective moral values themselves. Some things are really wrong. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior, they're truly evil. When Mr. Nugent denounces God for doing certain allegedly immoral acts, he actually bears witness to the truth of this premise. For in the absence of objective moral values and duties, no one can be condemned for doing anything, including God. But if at least some objective moral values and duties exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was by all accounts a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, with the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, 
he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three facts recognized by the majority of historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic, Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a Messiah who would be defeated and executed by his enemies. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible, naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God from the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, number five, the personal experience of God. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by uh, personally experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will, interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality that gave significance to their lives. Now, if that is the case, there's a danger that arguments for God could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own heart. For those who listen, God becomes a personal reality in their lives. So, in conclusion, then, we've seen five good reasons to think that God exists. If Mr. Nugent wants us to believe that God does not exist, then he must first tear down all five of the arguments that I presented, and then in their place erect a case of his own to show that God does not exist. Unless and until he does that, I think that theism is the more plausible worldview.
Thank you very much indeed, Professor Craig, and thank you indeed as well for keeping within the um, allotted time. I would now like to invite Michael Nugent of Atheist Ireland to present his case. Michael. Are we going to take that down? Is there a button here? My <laughs> fault. Okay, thank you. I'd like to welcome Bill to Ireland. I, I, Bill is a, is a sincere advocate for his beliefs. A week ago, I debated an equally sincere Hamza Tsortsis, whose path to Islam was very like Bill's path to Christianity. They were both in school at the time, and they both had an experience of faith after a conversation with a classmate, and they each committed their lives to spreading the word of God and Allah, respectively. Now, both Bill and Hamza know that their gods exist because of faith. And they're both using reason to help to lead people to a personal uh, truth that they both know by faith. And they're both good, sincere people. And at least one of them, if not both, are mistaken. I strongly believe there are no gods. So I'm a strong atheist. I also don't claim to be able to know that there are no gods. So I'm also an agnostic. Uh, I'm always happy to say, even on the question of whether there's a god, that I might be mistaken. But at the moment, I am as confident that the Christian God does not exist as Christians are that Thor does not exist. Does not, God exist is not merely a technical claim about how the universe came to be. It is also a claim about having moral authority uh, to tell people how to live their lives. And that puts a strong onus of proof and a strong responsibility on people making that claim. I want to suggest tonight, as, 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 we, as Bill has somewhat alerted in, in his last couple of comments, that essentially we're talking today about whether the Christian God exists. Because for any other God, both Bill and I will simply agree that they don't exist. Our only area of difference is whether the Christian God exists. So how do we evaluate what's most likely to be true? Well, I, I suggest, uh, un unlike Bill's last point, I suggest that, that faith and personal experience are the worst and least reliable ways of, of identifying what's true. They result in different people coming to different beliefs about the same reality. Applying reason to evidence is the most reliable way because it can more reliably result in different people coming to the same beliefs about the same reality. And when we apply reason to reality, I'm going to suggest tonight that the idea of a God seems implausible, that reality and morality both seem as they would expect, we would expect them to be if there was no God, and that there is a relentless pattern of natural explanations replacing supernatural explanations. I'm going to start with the idea of the uh, Christian God seeming implausible, obviously to somebody who doesn't already believe in it. That Christians typically believe that their God is a pure mind without a body, perfect and changeless, a first cause beyond time and space, all-knowing, all-powerful and all-good. Well, here are 20 reasons why that seems implausible. A pure mind without a body is an invented convenience because we have no evidence that a mind can exist without a body or a brain or a source of energy, and a lot of evidence to suggest that it can't. Even if we explore this invented convenience, a pure mind without a body might be aware of the existence of matter, but it couldn't interact with that matter because there would be no mechanism for it to do so. If this God is changeless, then it cannot create anything because it would have to change in order to do so. Even if you believed that it simply willed matter into existence, which is another invented convenience, then that act of will would be a change within that supposedly changeless mind. But if this mind is perfect, then it couldn't change anyway, because it would either become more perfect, which is impossible, or less perfect, in which case it would no longer be perfect. Even if it could change, it would not want to change, because being perfect, it would have no desire to do anything. If you respond that it was changeless, but it changed after it created the universe or when it created the universe, then it is simply false to say that it is changeless. Or could it change back to being changeless? And how would that change happen? If the God is no longer changeless or beyond time and space, then it may have ceased to exist sometime in the last 14 billion years. If this God is all perfect and all good, then it would have created a perfect universe. At a minimum, a perfect universe would not contain suffering 
or evil. If you respond that even a perfect God can only do what is logically possible, then it is logically possible to have a universe without suffering or evil. If you respond that the universe is actually perfect, but we just don't understand how, then why would the God have to intervene in this perfect universe through miracles? The Euthyphro dilemma still remains. Does the God command things to be good for arbitrary reasons? Or does it identify things as being good because they correspond to independent standards of goodness? If you respond that God's nature is to be good, and that gets you off, it doesn't, the dilemma still remains. Is the God's nature good for arbitrary reasons, or is it good because it corresponds to independent standards of goodness? All of the arguments for an all-good God can just as easily be used to support the idea of an all-evil God who gives us free will because it wants us to do evil voluntarily rather than force us to do evil. If this God is all-knowing, then it knows the taste of strawberry yogurt. But if it doesn't have a body or senses, then how can it know the taste of anything? And if you respond to that by saying, well, what it knows is it knows the truth of propositions, then it is not all-knowing, it is less than all-knowing. If this God is all-knowing, then it knows what we're going to do in the future. But if it knows that, then either we don't have free will, or else the God has consciously created free agents that it knows will do evil. If this God cares about humans on planet Earth, then at a minimum, it could have given us all the same information and the same moral messages. And finally, let me remind you that all of this is just exploring hypothetically an invented convenience, which is that there can be such a thing as a pure mind without a body or a brain or a source of energy. And you have to justify that before you move on to all of the supposed attributes. And you have to justify it in the actual world of reality, not just in the invented universe of discourse of theology. The second set of arguments that I want to make is that reality looks like we would expect with no God. Here are 10 reasons why. Theists believe that this God created the universe out of nothing, but the modern study of physics is based on patterns and not causes, and it only allows us to examine back as far as the Big Bang. We simply don't know what might have happened before that. Our universe, or any number of others, might have begun or might be eternal. Theists believe that this God created the universe with a purpose, but we don't see the universe moving towards any purpose. What we mostly see is impersonal forces pushing and pulling particles around and mostly moving towards a state of increasing disorder. Theists believe that this God fine-tunes the physical constants of the universe to allow life. But while these constants do allow life, they don't seem to be related to that or indeed any purpose. And in any case, from a theistic point of view, life has nothing to do with physical constants. It's spiritual. It could exist alongside any set of physical constants, or even without any physical matter at all. The whole point of theism is that our life is not bound to our physical bodies or physical constants, but is spiritual in nature. Indeed, if you believe that this God is a pure, bodiless mind, and if you also believe that matter cannot come from nothing, then the most rational theistic conclusion to come to would be that the God has spawned other pure, bodiless minds and that matter itself is an illusion. Theists believe that this God has a special relationship with human beings on planet Earth. But we see a universe that is incredibly wasteful for such an imagined purpose. If it exists, this human-focused God has wasted almost all of time and space in its human-focused plan. Our observable universe is 92 billion light-years in diameter and expanding. It has over 100 billion galaxies, each of which has 100 billion stars like our sun. We don't know how far our universe extends beyond the observable region. We don't know whether it is spatially finite or infinite, or if other universes exist that exist completely outside of it. Our observable universe is almost 14 billion years old. Life on Earth began about 3.8 billion years ago. Human life began about 200,000 years ago. The Abrahamic God supposedly revealed itself to human beings about 4,000 years ago. That's 4,000 years 
out of 14 billion years. For context, the Astronomer Royal, Royal Sir Martin Rees once compared the lifespan of our sun to a human being walking across America from New York to California. He said that on that scale, all of recorded human history would be four or five steps somewhere in the middle of Kansas, which, as Professor Rees put it, is hardly the apex of the journey. Theists believe that this God created human life as more special than other life. But we know that we are just one evolved species among many. There have been five billion species on Earth. 99% of them are extinct. Humans are one of the remaining 50 million species that currently share this tiny planet. We cannot live outside of the planet without the aid of technology. On the planet, we can only live on a small part of the planet's surface. The part that we can live on has earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis. We can die within seconds of being deprived of oxygen or for any other number of reasons. We can believe things and we can do things that are counterproductive to our survival. And those of us who do the fewest things that are counterproductive to our survival are the ones who survive. We have, however, evolved a capacity to apply reason to evidence. And that enables us to understand more about how the universe operates naturally. We can design models of reality to help us to understand how actual reality might work. And this provides us with fantastically reliable predictions about reality, particularly when contrasted to the utter unreliability of theistic beliefs. And this is enabling us to gradually move beyond earlier beliefs about supernatural agency. Whatever the specific mechanisms might be involved, human life is as we would expect it to look if there was no God, if there was natural evolution. Yet with astounding self-importance and grandiosity, many humans still believe that we, alone on our planet, alone in our galaxy and alone in the universe are the only living beings with God-given immortal souls. I want to move on now to the issue of morality. And I'm going to suggest that morality is also as we would expect it to be if there was no God. Again, here are 10 reasons why. Firstly, what do I mean by morality? An outcome is bad and I believe objectively so if it harms a sentient being, and an action is objectively wrong if the agent unjustly harms a sentient being. In any given situation, it can be easy or difficult to know what the right or wrong thing to do is. Now, if there was an all-knowing, all-perfect, all-good God that was the source of morality and that cared about human beings on planet Earth, at a minimum you would expect that he would be able to give us all the same moral message. And we would see throughout different parts of the world and different parts of history, everybody having the same sense of morality. If there was no God, what we would expect to see is that different sets of people at different times and at different places in the world would be evolving different sets of morality and different codes of morality. And that is indeed what we do see. So in parallel to applying reason to the evidence of reality in order to try to understand what is objectively true about reality, we can also try to apply reason to the evidence of our behavior to try to understand what is true about morality. And it is simply false to suggest that we need the assistance of a God to do that. There are many approaches to moral philosophy that do not invoke gods. I'm going to give you one plausible model. Morality has evolved in the brains of social animals, including humans, because both cooperation and competition are useful to survival. When parents look after their children, those children are more likely to grow up. When tribes cooperate in looking for food, those tribes are more likely to survive. And so genes for caring for children and genes for cooperating tend to be passed on from generation to generation and become more common. Now we see three phases of morality among social animals. The first phase is empathy and compassion, the second phase is cooperation and reciprocity. And the third phase is understanding fairness and justice. And many non-human animals will exhibit these types of morality. There was an experiment where rats would refuse food 
if they sold up when they ate the food, another rat uh, was electrocuted, which says a lot about human morality, setting up an experiment like that. There's another experiment where monkeys were given food if they put a token into a slot. Some monkeys couldn't figure it out. Another monkey would take their token, put it in the slot, and when the food comes out, give the food to the monkey that couldn't figure out the mechanism. But aside from that, humans and some other animals have a greater capacity for more nuanced morality because we have a greater capacity for reason. We can know that something is wrong because we can understand that it causes unjustified harm. So our sentience and our consciousness and our ability to reason give us a special role in sharing our lives with those who we share our lives on this planet in that our behaviour has consequences for other living beings but it does not give us a special place in the universe as a whole. Now, I sub so subscribe to a variation of John Rawls' social contract theory of morality. And what that is, is essentially, is how would a perfectly rational set of people design principles of justice for a society if we don't know in advance what position we would hold in that society? We don't know whether we're rich or poor, we don't know whether we be male or female, we don't know whether we be healthy or sick. And that veil of ignorance forces us to be impartial and to develop just, universally just principles. Now, my personal addition to that theory is that we also should not know what species we would be. Because I believe that one of the greatest injustices in our world, morally, is how we treat non-human animals. Every year we kill over 50 billion farmed animals and up to a trillion fish. And these sentient beings suffer unjustly for our convenience and our slaughter of them is an ongoing moral atrocity. In any given circumstance, it's already hard enough to understand and figure out what the, the right balance is between empathy and compassion and cooperation and reciprocity and fairness and justice. But religion corrupts this already difficult process by adding in imagined supposedly supernatural commands that are unrelated to the requirements of morality. And so you see verse 24 2 of the Quran saying flog adulterers a hundred times each and do not let your compassion stop you because clearly there were some early Muslims who realized that this punishment was disproportionate and immoral and so they had to be told and do not let your compassion stop you and you get Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel in the Bible where the Christian God repeatedly commands the Israelites to attack the cities of other tribes and to show them no compassion and to completely destroy them, putting to death man, woman, child and infant and leaving nothing alive that breathes. And you get otherwise good people like Bill here, who I genuinely respect as a good person, defending this act of slaughter because of his religious belief, on the grounds that it is good because God commanded it, even though it would have been bad if God had not commanded it, including defending the slaughter of infants and children on the basis that they would go straight to heaven. Not only is belief in a God not needed for morality, but belief in a God can actively corrupt our natural morality, even in the mind of an obviously good man like Bill. I'll address Bill's opening arguments in my next contribution. And Bill, I know I've given you a lot to respond to here, um, and I would like you to respond to as much as, as you can. Uh, but while you're doing so, can you please prioritise responding to these questions? Is it possible that you might be mistaken that the Christian God exists? If so, what evidence would convince you? And I'm happy to say I might be mistaken about my belief on it. How do you justify the supposed existence of a pure mind without a body when there is no evidence that such a thing can exist? And by what mechanism could such a thing create and interact with matter? Is it logically possible to have a universe without suffering or evil? Why is God's nature good? Is it good for arbitrary reasons? or because it corresponds to independent standards of goodness? How do you justify as objectively moral the Christian God repeatedly ordering the Israelites to slaughter children and infants of other tribes? And to summarize my overview, is there a God? I don't know. Bill doesn't know, none of us know. What's the most reliable way of finding out? I suggest that faith and personal experience are the least reliable and that applying evidence to, or reason to evidence is the most reliable. When we apply a reason to evidence, we notice that the idea of a God is implausible. We notice that reality and morality as, as, are as we would expect them to be if there was no God. And we also notice that natural ex explanations are relentlessly replacing supernatural explanations. 
And while there are still some questions that we still don't understand the answers to, I suggest on the basis of that relentless flow of natural explanations replacing uh, supernatural ones and nothing going in the opposite direction, that it is more reasonable than not until we get evidence to the contrary to believe that there is no God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, I might comment that on my uh, Twitter account and Facebook accounts, I'm getting some comments in why this is going on. And I like the one that says, um, will she be there? And another questioner says, how will this be decided? How will the winner be determined? By lightning bolt? <laughs> so <coughs> um, we now move on to the, the first stage of the rebuttals. And uh, I'd like to invite Professor Craig. Uh, he has 11 minutes for this stage of rebuttal. Uh, Bill, thank you. You'll recall that in my opening speech I said I would be defending two major contentions in tonight's debate. First, that there are good reasons to think that uh, God exists, and secondly, there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. In his opening speech, Mr. Nugent presented at least five atheistic arguments. Number one, he said there's no evidence that a mind might exist without a body. I have two points of response. First, we are acquainted with ourselves as immaterial persons. Reductive materialism doesn't work because mental properties are not identical with physical properties. For example, the brain is not jubilant or sad. Epiphenomenalism, that is the view that the physical brain has mental properties, is incompatible with self-identity over time, intentional states, thinking about things, with freedom of the will, and with mental causation. So it seems to me that the best view of ourselves is some sort of dualist interactionism. We are free agents who cause effects in our body. Uh, we are immaterial selves. But secondly, I've given arguments in my opening speech for the existence of a transcendent personal creator and designer of the universe and source of objective moral values. Those arguments require that there be a transcendent immaterial mind, and so that demonstrates the existence of such a thing. Number two, he says that if God is changeless, then it would be impossible for him to interact with the world. I agree with that, and the changelessness of God is not an article uh, of the Christian faith. I myself don't believe in God's changelessness. Number three, he said, if God is omniscient, it precludes human freedom. I spent seven years studying the relationship between divine foreknowledge and human freedom, and the argument for lo uh, theological fatalism is simply logically fallacious. To say that necessarily because God foreknows X, X will happen, and that God foreknows X, therefore necessarily X will happen, commits a fallacy in modal logic. So if he's going to defend fatalism, he needs to show us how his reasoning doesn't commit that logical error. Fourth, he says, what about all the evil in the world? Isn't that inconsistent with God's existence? Not at all. The atheist has an enormous burden of proof to show that it is logically impossible that God could have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, and no atheist has ever been able to carry that burden of proof. And for that reason, the logical problem of evil is today recognized as bankrupt by both theists and atheists alike. Paul Draper, a prominent atheist philosopher, says logical arguments from evil are a dying, dead breed. Even an omnipotent and omniscient being might be forced to allow evil for the sake of obtaining some important good. So the atheist has not been able to sustain the burden of proof of showing the logical impossibility of the coexistence of God and evil. Finally, Mr. Nugent says that God's existence 
is less probable given certain facts in the world such as the vastness of the universe, the rarity of human life, the suffering of li in life, and so on. Now, I simply disagree with that probability assessment. But even if I were to concede that these facts would be more probable on atheism than on theism, it doesn't follow logically from that that atheism is therefore more probable than theism. That represents a logical leap that ignores crucial factors in how probabilities are calculated. If the prior probability of theism is high, that is to say if there are good arguments for God's existence, then any improbabilities alleged by Mr. Nugent are simply swamped. So the question is, are there good arguments for theism? Well, that takes us back to my first contention, where I present five reasons on behalf of God's existence. First, the origin of the universe. All that Mr. Nugent said in response to this argument is that scientists don't know what there was before the universe. Well, science doesn't deal in certainties, but scientists do have a pretty good idea of what there was before the Big Bang. Namely, nothing. There wasn't anything prior to the Big Bang because the Big Bang represents the origin of space and time themselves. Moreover, the philosophical arguments for the finitude of the past show that the universe had an absolute beginning. And thus, we have good grounds for thinking that the universe had an absolute beginning. Since something cannot come out of nothing, there must therefore be a transcendent cause of the universe. And you remember Professor Swinburne's argument as to why this is plausibly a personal creator. Number two, a life-permitting universe. Here Mr. Nugent says that life could exist without fine-tuning. Well, yes, if you believe in the existence of God, you could have a miraculous uh, creation of life. But the point is that in any universe governed by our laws of nature, life cannot exist without the fine-tuning of these constants and quantities. And he needs to explain to us, if he denies design is the best explanation, what is the best explanation for why these constants and quantities all fall into this infinitesimal life-permitting range? Chance, the multiverse, uh, physical necessity, none of those explanations are as good as design. Thirdly, the moral argument for God's existence. Here, Mr. Nugent, I think, is deeply inconsistent. On the one hand, he says, that morality is evolved because we are social animals. Now, if he uses that in his argument to say that there are no objective moral values, that is a textbook example of the genetic fallacy, which is trying to invalidate a point of view by showing how someone came to hold that point of view. He needs to show that um, in uh, holding to his atheism that he, he would be consistent in saying that there are objective values. Now, he responds, well, the euthyphro dilemma shows that God cannot be the source of moral values and duties. Not at all. The euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma. God's nature is what Plato called the good, and it expresses itself to us in the form of divine commands which constitute our moral duties. It makes no sense to ask, what if God's nature were different because these are essential properties of God? He is essentially loving, kind, fair, compassionate, and so forth. And therefore, our moral duties are constituted by his commandments, and those are not arbitrary, but rooted in the essential nature of God himself. Mr. Nugent then um, responds that God could be evil, not if this moral argument is correct. Evil is a privation of goodness. Evil has no positive ontological status. It is the absence of goodness. So even if there were an evil supernatural being, there must still exist a higher God, a higher good God, which this lesser being fails to live up to, fails to approximate the standards of the absolute standard of goodness. So you can't say that the ultimate uh, explanatory um, source of morality is evil rather than good. Mr. Nugent says killing animals uh, is uh, an injustice. 
what's odd about this is it is precisely his atheism that justifies this sort of behavior toward animals. Listen to what Joel Marx, a naturalist, says. He says, if there was one thing I knew in this entire universe, it was that some things are morally wrong. It is wrong to toss chicks alive and conscious into a meat grinder, as happens in the egg industry. It is wrong to scorn homosexuals and deny them civil rights. It is wrong to massacre people in death camps. I knew in all my soul and all my conviction that they were wrong, wrong, wrong. But suddenly I knew it no more. I was not really skeptical or agnostic about it. I had come to believe and still believe that these things are not wrong. I used to think that animal agriculture was wrong. Now I will call a spade a spade and declare simply that I very much dislike it and want it to stop. I am simply no longer in the business of trying to derive an ought from an is. The point is that without God to serve as the absolute standard of good and evil, right and wrong, you are lost in moral relativism and you are landed precisely in the sort of injustice that uh, Mr. Nugent recoils from. In fact, when he condemns God for commanding things like the Israeli army to expel the Canaanites from the land, in order to condemn God for that, there must exist some objective standard of right and wrong, good and evil, because on his view, there really isn't anything the matter with genocide. Steven Pinker of Harvard University asks, if the distinction between right and wrong is a product of brain wiring, like Mr. Nugent believes, how could you argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong rather than just distasteful to us? Well, you can't, and that's what Joel Marx came to see. They're not really wrong on a naturalistic view, they're just distasteful. What then is the problem with the Old Testament command? Well, the problem would have to be that there's some inconsistency between God's being all good and is issuing that command. But I have shown and argued that there is no such inconsistency. I show this in question of the week number 16 on our website, and no one has yet tried to refute that demonstration. If Mr. Nugent wants to do more than make emotional appeals and rhetorical ploys, he needs to come to grips with that argument. We've heard nothing about the resurrection of Jesus, for which we have solid historical information. As for the experience of God, I would deny that the Islamic God is true because there are good defeaters of Islam, good rational objections to it, but I do not think, and we have not heard, comparable objections to Christian theism that would make me think that my Christian experience is delusory. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. Uh, I'd now like to invite Michael to rebut the first rebuttal and just to remind you we have uh, two further exchanges um, from the two speakers and then there'll be a short break. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I, as I said before, I think that Bill is an intelligent and sincere Christian apologist, and uh, he defines apologetics as making a case for the truth of Christianity. And he approaches it like a barrister in a court case, and he's very good at that. However, like any good barrister, he will sometimes engage in home team refereeing, which is applying greater skepticism to ideas that he opposes than he does to ideas that he supports. Now, that's exactly what you would want your barrister to do, but it's not what you would want your judge to do. And this contribution, I'm going to address some of Bill's arguments, uh, not only here, but also the, some of the key arguments that, that he makes in his books and websites. Uh, the Kalam argument is Bill's key argument. And I, I've actually shifted a little bit more away from that. There was some parts of that that, that I did agree with. I did think at one stage that it was um, relatively uncontroversial to think that the universe had a cause. I still think possibly but, uh, but I'm, I'm more open on that now, having studied more into the quantum physics of the, of the beginning uh, of whatever the expansion of the universe was. But let's take the, the Kalam argument, which I hope you're familiar with, that everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, and therefore the universe has a cause. 
I, I think that the first of those is, is kind of questionable because when we say that everything begins to exist in the context of people and planets and uh, tables and chairs, we're essentially talking about particles that already exist being rearranged where nothing new is actually coming into existence. New particles are being rearranged into new uh, patterns and we're calling part of those new patterns a table or a chair or a, a planet. Um, and when we go on to the question of the universe began to exist, uh, it, we, we, again, we just don't know the answer. Uh, you know, our physics only brings us back to the Big Bang. Maybe it began to exist, maybe it's eternal. We don't know. I used to think that, that, that it probably did. I now don't know. Um, but the conclusion, and this is the key thing about Kalam, that the conclusion that, uh, therefore, the universe had caused... Whether it's true or not, it doesn't follow from those two premises. Because there is an equivocation about the meaning of the phrase beginning to exist. Let, let's look at a parallel syllogism, which I call the Kalam papal movement argument. Premise one, bishops can only move diagonally. Premise two, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Conclusion, therefore, the Pope can only move diagonally. Now, clearly, we can see the flaw in that immediately. That in premise one, the word bishop means bishops on a chess set. In premise two, the word bishop means bishop in the Catholic Church. Now, similarly, in the Kalam argument, in premise one, begins to exist means particles that are already in existence being rearranged into new patterns. But in premise two, begins to exist means particles that never existed coming into existence out of nothing. Now, Bill has previously acknowledged that problem using the concept of Aristotelian material and efficient causes in that a, a, this table here or that table there would have a material cause, which is the wood and the metal and the, and the nails, and an efficient cause, which is the carpenter who put them together. Now, Bill has accepted that having um, a, a creation for nothing may seem implausible because it doesn't have a material cause, but he says that it's even more implausible to have something that has neither a material nor an efficient cause. Um, but surely that's an argument for neither being true. Uh, but, but, but the key thing is that his, his proposed pure bodiless mind is not even a, a probable or plausible efficient cause because there's no good reason to think that it exists. And the point that Bill made there about, uh, you know, we, we, we ourselves uh, have our own consciousness, that's because we have bodies. When, when our bodies die, our consciousness goes away, goes away and we're, we're uh, essentially aware that, that that's happening. So, so it come, what it comes back to is, is you know, we don't know the answer to this question. And it's not a satisfactory response to not knowing the answer, to invent an answer, say that that answer is also the source of human morality, and then tell us that we have to lead our lives in a certain way because of that. Uh, there, there are several um, papers that, that are, well, one particular paper that's cited in support of the idea that the universe had a cause by, by uh, Bordy Guth and Vilenkin. And that particular paper, I think, is, is, is uh, a lot more nuanced than, uh, than some people believe. What they are essentially talking about is not whether the universe had a beginning, but whether the expansion phase of the universe had a beginning. The two main authors that are, that are publicly uh, talking about, about this issue, uh, which is um, uh, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, both have different opinions on it. They, they both say that it's about the expansion of the universe. Alan Guth says he suspects the universe didn't have a beginning. Uh, Alexander Vilenkin suspects that the universe did have a beginning. But the paper itself doesn't talk about the universe having a beginning. It talks about the expansion of the universe having a beginning. The teleological argument, um, Again, we're down to the physical necessity, chance, or design. Again, that's kind of questionable because, because I hope you notice what Bill did there, that, that he, he applied uh, great skepticism to the two options that he disliked and then effectively gave a free pass by default to the remaining option that he liked because it's the only one left. But first of all, we don't know whether it's the only option left. And secondly, as I've said before, intelligent design by a god is the oddest of the options for, for, for fine-tuning physical constants. Because from a theistic perspective, a god wouldn't need to fine-tune physical constants. And from a scientific perspective, when Sean uh, Carroll debated Bill, he's a, a, a cosmologist, he argued that with different parameters, other forms of life might exist. 
that physicists may end up revising their understanding of the parameters, and that even if you think the parameters are fine-tuned, some of them would be massively over-tuned for the purpose of life. And the, the multiverse idea, um, there, there, I'll, I'll go into the multiverse idea in, in uh, my next contribution, but, but there uh, is, is data from the, the most recent thing, which is the Planck mission, uh, to, to suggest that um, it's favoring models of inflation that would lead to a multiverse. I want to move on to the moral argument, because, it, 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 and it's key, it, it doesn't flow from the others. Um, uh, here's another parallel syllogism, which I call the morality from creation argument. Premise one, the universe might have begun to exist. Premise two, the universe might have had a cause. Conclusion, therefore, you can't wear condoms. Now, there's no connection between those things, even if you believe that a God exists. So you need to justify the unrelated claim that the cause of the universe, whatever it may be, if it exists, cares about what we do. And the, the premises that Bill used effectively start by self-defining that God is the source of morality. If you don't start by accepting that God is the source of morality, then the syllogism doesn't work. I could just as easily argue that if the morality quark does not exist, then objective morality doesn't exist. It doesn't make it true. But I haven't done that. What I have done is I've given a plausible scenario for objective morality without invoking gods, involving a combination of evolutionary factors um, and the ability to reason articulated through a vegan variation of, of Rawls' social contract theory. Now, the moral philosopher Shelley Kagan put a similar argument to Bill when he debated um, morality with him. And Bill's response was that such a scenario doesn't give our actions any eternal cosmic significance. And Shelley Kagan responded, and I agree, that do that doesn't mean that our actions have no significance. Actions can have significance without having eternal cosmic significance. And Bill replied that that seemed hopeless to him. And Shelley replied, and I agree, well, it doesn't seem hopeless to me. And even if it did seem hopeless to all of us, that still wouldn't make it false. And finally, there are several questions about the, the, the Christian moral, moral argument. Two have already asked. Here's another question that Shelley Kagan raised that I think is quite interesting. If the point of moral duties on the cosmic scale is that the good are rewarded and the bad are punished for eternity, then how is it just that people who lead morally evil lives can escape their eternal punishment by simply repenting on their deathbed? I want to now move on to some examples, finally, for this part, of some examples of Bill's um, home team referees. Uh, on his website and in his books, he applies greater scepticism to ideas, he opposes them to ideas that he supports, which is understandable if you're trying to prove something that you already are convinced of the truth of. But his overall case depends on the cumulative effect of all of the arguments, and so that's weakened if the arguments for some points undermine the arguments for others. On his website, Bill was asked why his theistic arguments seem to depend on contradictory metaphysical systems. And Bill replied that he deliberately crafts his arguments to not depend on any metaphysical system so that they can be accepted by people of varying metaphysical outlooks because that broadens their appeal and makes them more immune to refutation. Now, if so, that places advocacy for an existing belief ahead of searching for the truth. When opposing physical necessity as a response to the question of fine-tuning, Bill says that this is a radical position put forward without any proof. Yet when defending design, he says that God is a pure mind without a body, which is a radical position put forward without any proof. When opposing the multiverse as a response to the question of fine-tuning, Bill says that the proposed mechanisms for generating a multiverse are vague, and the multiverse may itself require fine-tuning, which would start the problem all over again. Yet when defending intelligent design and asked who designed the designer, Bill says that in order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the designer, or of, of the explanation. So whether the designer has an explanation can simply be left an open question for future inquiry. Now, none of what I have said makes any of Bill's specific conclusions false, but it is a reason to be cautious about the overall case that he makes. And I will address in my next contribution the, the idea that faith is ultimately why Bill believes in the Christian God and that without that faith, no amount of reason will get you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And again, thanks to both speakers for 
keeping to a, a tough timetable. Uh, we have two further seven minute contributions from each of the two speakers, then a short break, and then you'll have a chance uh, to ask your questions. So could I call again on Bill, please, uh, for his last seven minute rebuttal. Thank you. So are we going to have those PowerPoints uh, again for this speech? It helps to have the arguments displayed as you speak about them. Before looking again at those five reasons I gave in be on behalf of God's existence, let's review Mr. Nugent's case for atheism. He simply reiterated his argument that there cannot be an unembodied consciousness or mind, but he didn't refute my point that neither reductive materialism nor non-reductive materialism gives a plausible account of the mind-body relation, and he needs to do that if he's going to carry his point. Secondly, remember, I said that my arguments prove the existence of such an unembodied mind or being, and so he needs to refute those arguments. He then dropped his arguments about divine immutability, the incompatibility of omniscience with uh, human freedom, the problem of evil, and whether or not the vastness of the universe and so forth is more probable on uh, atheism than on theism. So let's go back then to those five arguments that I offered on behalf of premise or the contention one, that there are good arguments to think that theism is true. First, the origin of the universe. Now, Mr. Nugent accuses me of committing equivocation with regard to the phrase begins to exist. I plead not guilty. When I say begins to exist, I use the following definition. X begins to exist at T if and only if x exists at t and there is no time t prime earlier than t at which x exists. That is an intuitive and univocal definition of that concept that holds throughout the argument. He says, but scientists don't know what there was before the beginning. Merely reiterating his former assertion, I explained that there's nothing before the beginning because it is the beginning of space and time itself. He says, well, but the board Guth Vilenkin's theorem only implies that the current expansion began uh, to exist, not the cosmos. This is simply false. Alexander Vilenkin, in his book, Many Worlds in One, states, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. In the fall of 2015, the Lincoln made the even stronger statement. We have no viable models of an eternal universe. The board guth Lincoln theorem gives reason to believe that such models simply cannot be constructed. Thus, I think we have excellent evidence to think that the universe had an absolute beginning and since something cannot come out of nothing, there must be a transcendent cause. And I've already argued, using Professor Swinburne's argument, for the personhood of that cause. This argument alone gives us grounds for rejecting atheism this evening. If this were the only argument I carried, it would succeed in showing that atheism is false. Secondly, what about a life-permitting universe? Here, Mr. Nugent, again, simply reiterated that God could miraculously create life without fine-tuning. Granted, but that's irrelevant. That, that doesn't speak to the issue of the fact that for any universe governed by our laws of nature, these constants and quantities must be exquisitely fine-tuned 
in order for life to exist, non-miraculously, without violating the laws of nature. And so the question is, what's the best explanation of this? Chance, physical necessity, design. It seems to me that design is the far more plausible explanation. He says, well, with regard to the multiverse, you can just leave it an open question. That wasn't the objection I posed to the multiverse in this debate, which was the problem that we ought to be observing a much different universe if we are just a random member of a multiverse. Remember, the idea of a single brain is the most simple, observable universe that could exist, and that's what we ought to be observing or thinking if we think that a multiverse explains the fine-tuning. As for the moral argument for God's existence, um, here he appeals to Shelley Kagan and the debate that I had with him. What Kagan holds to is a very different view than Mr. Nugent's. Kagan says that what is right and wrong is what would be determined by a perfectly rational committee of people. The problem with that is that it just begs the question by assuming that a person, perfectly rational person couldn't be a naturalist like Mr. Nugent, who is a nihilist and doesn't believe there are any objective moral values. So this is part of the same incoherence. Mr. Nugent wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to hold that moral values are simply the spin-offs of biological evolution and social conditioning, and yet he wants to exhibit moral outrage at injustice. Uh, and immorality is done, and you can't do both. You need to have an absolute transcendent standard for right and wrong beyond sociocultural mores in order to judge what is good and what is evil. And I think that there is no reason to deny our moral experience in this regard. Remember, as I said, any argument for moral skepticism is going to be based on premises that are less obvious than the existence of objective moral values themselves. John Healy, who was the president of Amnesty International, wrote in a fundraising letter, I am writing to you today because I think you share my profound belief that there are indeed some moral absolutes when it comes to torture, to government-sanctioned murder, to disappearances. There are no lesser, lesser evils. These are outrages against all of us. So if you agree with me that there are at least some objective morals and duties, then you should agree that God exists. The resurrection of Jesus has gone undiscussed in tonight's debate. Remember, we saw that the majority of historians accept the three fundamental facts that undergird the inference to Jesus' resurrection, and that is why I am a Christian theist rather than a Muslim or a Jew. Finally, the experience of God uh, again, he dropped the point in his last speech. I pointed out that unlike Christian experience, I think there are good defeaters of Islamic uh, religion uh, that make it less rational. And therefore, I think that the Christian is entirely within his rights to trust his personal experience of God unless and until the atheist is able to show that he's suffering from some psychological delusion, which Mr. Nugent certainly hasn't done tonight. Thank you very much, Professor Craig. Um, both speakers will, of course, have a, a, a final wrap-up of five minutes each a little later in the proceedings, but could I now ask Michael for his seven-minute rebuttal? Thank you. Okay, so I've asked Bill several questions. Uh, the first was, is it possible you might be mistaken that the Christian God exists? I haven't got an answer to that yet. I hope, Bill, you'll get around to it in, in, the, um, in, in the summary. Um, how do you justify the supposed existence of a pure mind without a body when there's no evidence that such a thing can exist? And by what mechanism could such a thing create and interact with matter? Now, Bill referred to ourselves and our own identity, uh, which seems to be separate from our bodies. But, but we have bodies. Without our bodies, we wouldn't have that uh, evolved thing. It, it, it is a, an, an emergent property from the fact that we have physical properties, although we don't yet understand how it happens. How does it, how does it evolve? How, how can uh, non-conscious atoms display consciousness? 
well, how can non-wet atoms display wetness? It's an emergent property that we still have to understand the nature of, but it's not particularly problematic in principle. I asked, is it logically to have a universe without suffering or evil? Bill replied that it's not logically impossible. That wasn't the question I asked, is, is it logically possible? If it's logically possible, then a perfect God should be able to do it. He said that evil, um, evil is merely the deprivation of, 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 uh, of good. Yeah, but if you have the evil God, then you can say that good is merely the deprivation of evil. It's just a personal choice, whichever one you prefer. There's no stronger argument for a good God than there is for an evil uh, God. I asked, why is God's nature good? Is it good for arbitrary reasons, or is it good because it corresponds to independent standards of goodness? The same to reply that God's nature is the good. Um, but that was essentially the answer to the previous question, which was, why does God command, or does God command things to be good? It's not that the answer to the question, uh, why is God's nature good? Um, still need an answer to that. How do you justify as objectively moral the Christian God repeatedly ordering the Israelites to slaughter children and infants of other tribes? Um, uh, you, you'll, not, you'll notice Bill didn't say that it was wrong. You know, still looking for a justification why Bill believes that it was right, morally good, um, under theism, uh, to, to uh, slaughter children and infants. Um, and another question that I asked um, that I hope Bill will get around to answering in, in the, the summation is how is it that people can lead morally good lives, can escape their eternal punishment by simply repenting on their deathbeds? Now, there was some talk about um, the uh, Borde Guth, the Lincoln paper, which is, which is quite critical to some of these, these debates. And, and what, what Bill is repeatedly saying is, is that that shows that there was a beginning to the universe. Now, it doesn't. Um, Bill quotes a... a, a a quote by Alexander Vilenkin, who's one of the, the authors of the paper. And that quote is accurate, it is what, what, what Alexander Vilenkin mm -hmm. said. But here's the actual paper, the actual paper. And the only reference in the actual paper to the phrase beginning of the universe, or the concept of the beginning of the universe, is when it is referring to a past boundary of the inflation region, the inflating region of space-time. And what the paper says is, what can lie beyond this boundary? Several possibilities have been discussed one being that the boundary of the inflating region corresponds to the beginning of the universe in a quantum nucleation event. That's all it says. One possibility uh, is, that is being discussed. Now, uh, Alan Guth is quite, has, has expressed his belief that he believes it probably doesn't have a beginning and he believes that it's eternal. Alexander Vilenkin, um, Bill is right, Alexander Vilenkin has said that he believes that it does have a beginning. He leans more towards it probably being a, a beginning there being a beginning. But he's been more nuanced than that quote, and that quote precedes these other quotes by Alexander Belenkin that, that, that I'm, I'm going to, to, to say. In 2010, he was asked, does it mean that the, the universe is beginning? He said no, but it proves that the expansion of the universe had a beginning. Um, he also said in a, in a follow-up email during that exchange, I would say that the short answer is yes, if you're willing to get into subtleties, then the answer is no, comma, but, dot, dot, dot. Um, he, was, he, he still thinks the answer is probably yes, and I'm not disputing that. His co-author thinks the answer is, is probably no. But significantly for the Kalam argument, Alexander Valenkin also said, I would now like to take issue with the first part of the Kalam argument. Modern physics can describe the emergence of the universe as a physical process that does not require a cause. What causes the universe to pop out of nothing? No cause is needed. If you have a radioactive atom, it will decay, and quantum mechanics give the decay probability in a given interval of time, say a minute. There is no reason why the atom decayed at this particular moment and not another. The process is completely random. No cause is needed for the quantum creation of the universe. Now, the key thing here in terms of these overall arguments is that Bill cannot have it both ways. He cannot quote Vilenkin over his co-author in terms of the idea that the universe probably had a beginning in terms of his premise two in Kalam, and yet reject the same analysis by the same scientist in terms of premise one of his argument that, the, that there must have been a cause. Um, finally, in terms of the morality, uh, Bill seemed to suggest, or in fact, if I remember correctly, he did suggest that my, my position is different to Shelley Kagan's. It, it, it's not. I, I did say essentially the same thing. That, that, it, that, that I do believe in a variation of the, the, um, the social contract theory that, that, that John Rawls has put forward, that, it, that it's, perfect people, it, it's perfectly rational people. Now, it's a thought experiment. It's not real, obviously. But if perfectly rational people were to analyze through this veil of ignorance 
what would be the, the universally just principles for a society that they would want to live in if they didn't know what position they would have within that society, then that would give you something that is objectively good and, and bad, objectively right and wrong, because it would be independent of any individual person's uh, belief, because it would be based on pure reason. Now, obviously, each person would interpret it subjectively, because that's all that we can do with anything. But, but, but there are, it's only one of many theories in moral philosophy that don't invoke gods. It's simply false to say that, uh, that, that you need a god to understand morality. There, there are man, many ways to do it. And I, I, I simply reject the idea of the burden of proof that Bill is placing uh, on what he collectively calls the atheist, because I, I think that it's the other way around. I think that we, we, we know that there is a natural world. We, we all agree on that. And it is the theist that is adding an extra dimension that is in dispute. And so the, the onus of proof lies on the theist and not on the atheist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for your patience collectively. At this stage, I'd like to thank both speakers, in fact, for a very reasoned and inspiring and intelligent and courteous debate. Not always the case in this particular contested area. We have a short break now of about four minutes, and what I'm going to say is that um, in terms of questions, we'd like you either to tweet your question, if you have one, to Uncover Cork at Uncover Cork is the address on Twitter, or else to write it out in a good old-fashioned piece of paper. And please say what your question is and which speaker you want it addressed to. What is your question and who is it for? Thank you.